with those who are subjected to it. So with that in mind, please give a very large and warm welcome to Eva Schloss, Linda Warnick, and Tommy Wright as I invite them to join me on the stage. Once you 
have uh, you created your own family. That gives you an impetus to carry on with life and uh, try to contribute to other people. And we feel, I feel we have a mission. We have a mission to make sure that people don't stand by and make sure that life, uh, that um, the sort of tragedy that happened to our nation doesn't happen again. It, when you, we, we are a traumatized generation from myself, speaking for myself. And we have to come together, somehow uh, find the inner strength to carry on. Uh, it was not easy, it was very difficult, um, and really, in a way, I was lucky because I had family to look after, a family that took care of us. Uh, but it is life and love <coughs> for, for me. Um, I must admit, when I came back from the camp and I was realizing that we will never be a family again, I lost my very, very precious father and brother. My brother was not quite 18 years old when he was killed by the Nazi. My father was 45. And um, I got very, very depressed. And it was actually Otto Frank who came to us, he who had lost everybody, who told me, you know, um, you're young, you've got a full life ahead of you, and there's a lot, a lot of wonderful things that are going on for you. And of course, I didn't want to believe it, and I suffered a lot. I was really, really miserable for many, many, many years. But I think meeting my husband and the birth of my first daughter was really uh, a wonderful experience. And I realized that life has a lot to offer and you must make the most of it, which I did. Um, I had three professionals, I traveled the world, and now still, with nearly 90, I go, <clears throat> I've been in China, I've been in Australia, a lot in America, um, many, many uh, come to Japan talking about the danger of prejudice and hatred and the uh, uh, applause I get, the uh, agreement I get from the people that are going to help to make a better, safer, better world for everybody is uh, very, very optimistic. And this is really what gives me a will to carry on, even at this age. And um, I must say I have enjoyed uh, a great part of my life. Thank you. Well, uh, I didn't speak about uh, my experiences uh, in the Holocaust for 55 years to no one, to even uh, to my family uh, and uh, my wife passed away in 2003. She didn't know what happened to me. I never told her either. She knew that I was a Holocaust survivor, and uh, that's all. It was in 2004, for the first time, that I began to write an article in magazines about my experiences in the concentration camp, and then the media came onto me, and uh, so I realized uh, that really I'm living in Ireland, that they know very little about the Holocaust. And finally, I began to speak in school, colleges, university, private events, because I thought there were two reasons. First of all, that uh, education is the most important uh, thing now, because there are many people that are trying to deny that the Holocaust even happened. And therefore, it was important that I speak to the young people especially and uh, voice them uh, that they, if they see any racist bullying in the school, 
against uh, uh, students that are different religion, or the foreigners, or the different color skin. I warn them that if you see it, don't become a bystander. Get involved and say it's wrong. Because when we were suffering and uh, it was happening to us, nobody said anything. And the huge tragedy of uh, uh, the Jewish people happened. The second reason was that I told that I owe it to the victims that their memory is not forgotten. I was 35 member of my family, my grandparents, my uncle, uh, cousin, uh, aunt, people that I knew, I played with my cousins, and one day we said goodbye to them, and we never saw them again. So to, for me, till I can, I will be speaking up and telling and educating uh, the young people that this should never happen again. This was the slogan, in fact, when uh, the war ended, never again. But we can't say it today. I visited <coughs> Srebrenica, where I saw 8,000 graves of people that uh, in the genocide against the Muslim there. I prayed over their graves because uh, for me uh, this was again something that shouldn't have happened. And that did not happen in 1945, it happened in 1995 in a Central Europe, in the civilized society. So we can't say today, never again. And therefore we have to educate and all the people that racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism are very, very dangerous, especially in this time. So I will continue till I can do it. Being in that mindset. Um, but it, 
feels to me like I'm a psychology teacher and it feels to me like it is possible for humans to be in my mindset. And I just wondered if you could speak a little bit about the Germans around you and how, you know, did they, not the Nazis themselves, but the other Germans that allowed it to happen, was it a sort of slow boiling frog? Was it a thing, uh, like how did it happen there so that we can try and avoid it here, I guess? slavery, the whole 
Europe, Europe have worked together to slavery. Um, the French in Indochina, the British in South Africa, they started actually concentration camps with the South Africa, with the Boers, you know? Um, what, what are we for human beings? We should examine us. Who are we? What are we doing with, with our other people, with other people, with our, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think education, I've heard you all say, is like, the only solution for us. The only solution. <laughs> It is a very complex uh, uh, question. Uh, it's not black and white. Uh, it wasn't the majority in Germany that uh, they wanted this to happen. But the regime in Germany was very cruel. And uh, if anybody even raised a little bit their voice, uh, there was no two things about it. Uh, they were executed. Uh, for hiding Jews, uh, they were executed. So it was a small minority <coughs> that this fear imposed on the uh, German how they uh, had to obey. I made a film. Uh, I wanted to meet one of the guards of uh, Belgian person. Uh, she's still alive. Uh, she was a supervisor uh, in uh, Belgian Belsen. Uh, she was only about 24 years old at the time. She could have been the daughter of my mother. And uh, they were very, very cruel, especially the woman. The, all the supervisors, the, the woman supervisor, they were in their 20s, 22. 23, uh, and uh, they behave very cruel well. And, but when you think about them, the, I know about this woman uh, from her childhood. Uh, she went through indoctrination in the Hitler Jugend up to uh, uh, the time she became a cis woman. Uh, she was uh, indoctrinated with lies. And uh, she came from a village, very primitive girl. When she went to Berlin, she didn't know how to use a telephone or use a tram. And suddenly, she became a guard in the Berlin Berlin concentration camp. And here she had a power that she never experienced in, in her life. So I visualize these things as well, that they were victims of the time as well. Of course, uh, we have to remember that what happened in the Holocaust was done by highly intelligent people uh, that went to university, that were in colleges, and out of the intelligentsia, they become murderers. So that's the other side of uh, uh, the, the coin. But uh, today, uh, when uh, I give lecture, it's happened to me uh, in a school that uh, uh, the teacher told me that somebody wants to ask me a question after the question time. I, if it's all right, I said, all right. And these four girls come front of me and they said, we are German, you hate us. And I said, not at all. Actually, you are very brave because Germany brought the young people of Germany, created a democracy that is better uh, than many other democracies in other states of uh, uh, Europe. So that I should hate them. I can be an insult because I can't blame them for what the grandparents uh, did. The, the laws in Germany are much stricter today than in any other country. Uh, so it's a very complex uh, uh, situation. And there are people, and Jewish people, like Eva said, uh, that. Uh, they wouldn't buy a German car, they wouldn't uh, 
uh, go to Germany, no these things. And I don't know if this is the answer for us. Thank you very much, all three. Uh, any further questions? Uh, I must. Dear Master. <laughs> <laughs> this is well my to sir. This is not my question. This, this is a question asked by a young boy this afternoon. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask it so people here tonight can hear Tommy's response. Tommy, if you recall the boy that asked about the transportation and the cattle carriages, and you talked about um, not feeling human anymore. I'd like to hear that again, and I think people would benefit from that. But, yeah. I was asked uh, the question that uh, not only me, but uh, three of us were asked, what was the worst thing uh, that happened to you during uh, uh, the uh, Holocaust? Uh, what happened? Of course, I'm a survivor of Berlin, Belgium, so you could see uh, from the film uh, that we just saw, uh, it was a horrific place. There were even people that come from Auschwitz uh, to Bergen-Belsen and they asked them uh, what you think about Bergen-Belsen and they said, uh, well, Auschwitz was a horrific uh, camp, but nothing like here in uh, Bergen-Belsen, what was happening there. But I found one moment in my life and I still think that this was a worst moment that uh, could have happened to me and this was we were in a, a transit camp in Slovakia where they did the selection and every week uh, twice or three times uh, several hundred people were brought from the uh, uh, high-ranking uh, German officer his name was Alios Brunner you might have heard about him he, get a, he got a babysit, he lived his life in Syria and never brought justice. But uh, he played a god. He decided who's going to die and who's going to live. And uh, the young man and woman went to the right side, uh, the mother, children, old people, left side. We knew what that meant. So when our family crown from front of Arius Brunner, Seven, we were 13 uh, from the family court at the same time. Seven went to the right side, six of us, which was my grandmother, my aunt, one of my cousins, my mother, my brother, and myself. To the left at the time, we knew that, uh, what it meant. Uh, in late 1944, the Jewish people already knew about it. Uh, crematorias about the guard chamber, so you can imagine the adult among us, I of course didn't know because I was only nine years old, I wasn't told, but they knew what it meant, so uh, I remember just my mother squeezing myself and my brother to herself uh, because she knew what going to happen. Then we were moved and we were going into the cattle car. And here we were, in a civilized uh, people, still in the detention camp, we got uh, uh, good food, we didn't starve. Uh, we were treated rough, but it, it wasn't so bad. And suddenly we were pushed into this cattle car, and once the doors closed behind us, we were no longer a uh, human beings. We were forced that the animals that were transported uh, in these cabins. There was no privacy, there was no food, there appeared very little water only for drinking, so there was no uh, hygiene or anything like that. I remember at the time people wanted to uh, go on toilet, there was a, a barn in the middle of the uh, open bar in the middle of the carriage. There were about 50 of us. Uh, I'm sure you saw what the uh, cattle cart looked like. So you couldn't move. It was full up, a couple of buckets. But then eventually uh, you had to go. And 
it was in the open. Suddenly, uh, the embarrassment, everything is gone. And I like said, we were like animals. And so I consider that moment of the change that from one moment we were civilized people and the next moment we were no human being uh, at all. Tony, thank you. Uh, we're regrettably running out of time. We have another event after us to see the exhibition, guys. I know you are uh, very cordially welcome. We have catered for all of you. And uh, even can I perhaps give the last word to you in the sense that what is it uh, that you could articulate everybody here could do that you would think would be the most important thing they could do? I'm sure you're probably speaking for Mindu and Tommy at the same time. What, 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 would, what should we leave with ringing in our ears and not forget? Uh, Uh, it is important. Uh, 
I found it very uh, uplifting that they invited me to speak in a mosque and uh, I was delighted to do it. So, and that's the idea of people like ourselves. Uh, not only uh, we speak and tell our story, but we have to be example uh, for trying to uh, bring the harmony between uh, different uh, religions and, uh, and people with different backgrounds. to resist 
to return of the evil that turned Europe into a wasteland. When accepting an honorary doctorate in the University of Worcester, Mindu vowed, I will fight those who forget, because if we forget, we are guilty. We are accomplices. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. In the preface of Ava's first book, she explained, I became convinced that if I could move only a handful of people to care more for their fellow man, I would achieve something worthwhile, and that it was my duty to do just that. No survivor can ever bring back their loved ones, nor can they rid their memories of the horrors they endured. Yet still, you three continue to put yourselves through the pain of remembering in the hope that no one else should ever suffer as the way you have. Eva, Tommy, and Mindu, please rest assured you continue to achieve way more than you could perhaps ever have imagined or fully appreciate. Your energy, your selflessness, your commitment, your resolve, your bravery, and your regard for your fellow man is truly inspiring. Hearing and reading what you have to say is an unforgettable experience, and it absolutely does make a positive difference to how people think and feel about the responsibilities that we have to each other. With that in mind, I'd like to invite the audience to join me in commending you for your continued efforts to build a better world and for the values you exemplify. You are special people, and it's right that you should feel the love and warmth of our gratitude and admiration. Thank you so much.